Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, I was wondering, if I say the word Shazando, what do you uh, think of? Pasta. Um, You're not wrong. Well, you are a little bit, but that's okay. All right. What What do you think of when we say the word uh, pronounced correctly, which is scherzando? <laughs> Music. Ooh. <laughs> oh. That's correct. So this was a me thing. All right. Never mind. <laughs> No, everyone pronounces it Shirzando. Um, it's totally normal. <laughs> All right, excellent. Well, uh, since we have a couple experts who are going to be able to explain that better to me, we have Elizabeth Belisario. Hello. We have Amber Gilchrist. Uh, also, hello. To uh, talk about the game that uh, has a name apparently I can't pronounce correctly. <laughs> so, well, we can get the name out of the way. Um... It's an Italian musical term that means playing, and so we figured that was an appropriate name for a game that uses music. It yes. turns out it's a name that no one can pronounce, which is kind of our first big design flaw, but um, we have committed to it at this point, and it's kind of just part of the personal brand, is that everyone's going to pronounce it Sherzando, um, and that's just part of the joke at this point. You, you could always rename it to Meza Forte. <laughs> Much simpler name. <laughs> I mean... You could just short it to Forte or just like rest. <laughs> just, just do rest. a rest, just a rest symbol for the game name. And people be like, what's that? And be like, your music majors will be like, oh, that, that's a rest. Sure. Well, you know, possibilities abound, but I'm, I'm going to assume that, uh, you know, the name is pretty much the name, you know. But the thing is, if it is like the idea of playful, uh, you know, it shouldn't matter so much. If people mispronounce it. Yeah, exactly. You know, what's funny is uh, I had looked up the word as I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll find out a little bit of information about the game. And I found out that it was an actual word, which I was not aware of. And then it told me that it was a musical term. And I thought, oh, well, that's perfect for the the theme of the game, which we'll get to in a second. You know, what's funny is uh, I had looked up the word uh, because I was thinking, oh, maybe I'll find out a little bit of information about the game. And I found out that it was an actual word, which I was not aware of. And then it told me that it was a musical term, and I thought, oh, well, that's perfect for the the theme of the game, which we'll get to in a second. But what's funny is, if you look at the Merriam-Webster listing for it, it gets very judgmental and lets you know that its popularity is in the bottom 30% of words. And I thought to myself, (laughs) Merriam, that's not cool. Don't judge that word the way that way. That's just mean. Why would you even say that? I guess. Well, even among music, I think it's it's not as popular as just scherzo, which means like joke, not joking. It's oh. actually pretty rare to come across it, but it does exist. So scherzo would be like the high, the, the word that I'm not going to be able to pronounce correctly is like the hello or good morrow to you. Something like that. <laughs> it's the closest I'm going to get. But anyway, now that we've uh, explained in great detail what the word <laughs> is i was uh, i was hoping you could tell me what the what the game is that is uh, being built around that we would love to uh, scherzando is a musical tabletop role playing game about things going explosively wrong where you play both the characters and the soundtrack oh is there singing involved in this not so much singing um, more uh tapping on things maybe humming if you want playing recorders and other various instruments. Is it more like the game's sound effects from Whose Line Is It Anyways? Let's pretend, just hypothetically, that I haven't seen Whose Line Is It Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest going ahead and watching that right now. We can wait. Just right now. Um, <laughs> right. right. That, the game on that show, because that was an improv show, was you had two people who were being the characters and then two other people who were supplying the sound effects for those characters. That's pretty similar. Cool. Now we have a basis to go off of. Nice. Okay, excellent. Well, if I really wanted to sing, if I thought to myself, like, you know, it's like karaoke that nobody asked me to perform, do that and justify it somehow. So, kind of. 
you do get to like perform music and you do often get to use your voice to do that if you would like during the game but it's usually happening at the same time as other players are playing their characters so you kind of have a background music track at the same time as the scene is being played through so when you start singing and singing actual words along with that it can be hard to pay attention to both the thing that you're singing and the things that people are saying um and it gets pretty complicated pretty quickly so we like to try to suggest that people stick with the more uh, nonverbal um, or at least non-lyrical forms of music. Okay. So let's actually delve a little bit into the actual structure of the game. Uh, how do you play? Uh, <laughs> how do you Skirzando? play this game is what Nathan is <laughs> trying to say. So Scherzando is structured around a series of scenes. And um, in each scene, you have some of the people at the table are playing their characters and some people are playing instruments. And who who's playing which one shifts scene per scene. But throughout the course of the scene, the musicians are trying to, without words, communicate a certain emotion and drive the plot of the story. And at the end of the scene, when it reaches kind of a point where it could go either way, either the characters are, they could get away with it, they could pull it off, or everything could come crashing down around them. Um, at that point, they have to guess which emotion the musicians have been playing towards. The better they guess, the better the scene goes for them. Yeah, so when people hear that it's a game about music, probably the most common response we get after, like immediately after people go, oh, that's so cool. The very next thing they always say is like, I'm terrified. I could never do that. I don't know anything about music. That was um, my reaction. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. It's a very normal reaction that we get to the game. Okay. Um, and that's actually been like a real concern of ours for like the entire phase of development. We've been having conversations about that for about a year and a half now about how to like absolutely make sure that the game is completely accessible to anyone regardless of their musical skill level and also especially um how to make people feel like they can be comfortable regardless of their skill level playing this game and how to how to help people feel like they're like allowed to express themselves with music and they're allowed to like not have to worry about messing up while they're like in the space at the table so it's a game where you know you're trying to play towards certain emotions but you're not penalized or or rewarded for how closely you can play towards any particular musical type, right? Or any musical style. It's very much a game where you can know nothing about music and you can sit down and you can just plunk your way towards whatever feels like an emotion that you're trying to get across um, and have just as much success as someone who sits down um, with 30 years of professional jazz experience who knows exactly how to improvise towards a specific sound. The purpose isn't necessarily about like trying to be the best music player at the table. Um, the point is just trying to communicate with what you have. So basically, if I just uh, have the ability to tap on the table, I'm going to tap my hardest on that table. Yeah, exactly. If you've got tapping on the table, you can play the game. My question is, do you have to have a sense of rhythm and or pitch? Or can you be completely bad at those and still play? We like to say that as long as you can listen to music with intention, you can play this game. Well, I have the intent to listen to music. Then you can play the game. I have the intent to listen to music most of the time, regardless of whether I understand it or not, or can pronounce the lyrics. Or the names. <laughs> or names. Or the names. Yeah. Skirt Sando? Not quite there. I'm gonna get by the end of this interview. I'm gonna get it. Damn it. You're gonna, I believe in uh, you. Okay. I do. Well, thanks, Amber. <laughs> thanks for that. So the way that you had originally presented this to me uh, was uh, as as like a diceless GMless, mm -hmm. as, uh, like an RPG, essentially an RPG. That seems like to me the novice. It's like that's everything I know about RPGs. <laughs> what am I going to do? Well, in the development process, we originally had both a GM and dice, but um, we've refined those out. We just think it, I don't know, dice added too much. The way we were using dice was incorporated into the end of the scene where players were looking to succeed by guessing. And the dice were introducing an element of randomness there. And we we decided it was it was too much 
and the dice could swing it too far and we wanted to make sure players could be accurately rewarded for successful guessing without having that randomness in play. There's no um, like character stats. Your character has a goal and some some attributes, some uh, attributes of their character and flaws and stuff. And those mainly don't have mechanical effects in the game. That's purely to guide your role playing. It's not a very crunchy system. So in a lot of ways, uh, you know, the the most random element is the player themselves. Uh-huh. What what actually inspired you to start creating the game in the first place? So um, this actually wasn't either of our ideas in the in the first place. We were both an, at the time that we began this project, students at Northwestern University, and the original concept of the game um, was from a small group of. Um, other students at the university and I got pulled into that project right at the beginning and it's like very early concept phases when it was just a question of like an RPG but as a musical like what would that look like how could you do that um when it was still in those like really early phases um and then everyone else in that project except for me dropped out of it all like really immediately like after maybe a couple of weeks of talking about research and looking at what what had been done in the past and so it was just me left on that project and as a little fun fact I don't know anything about music, just absolutely nothing whatsoever. And so I needed like some someone who had some kind of experience in music to help me out. Um, And so one of the people in the original group like connected me with like their like their girlfriends, roommates and like a whole like there's a a series of things. Um, And I eventually ended up with Elizabeth, who uh, I didn't know at the time, um, but she ended up being basically like the best co-developer I could have asked for. Um, And she's been around since then for the past like year and a half. So like the original inception was not us. But I think like the reason that we've stuck with it and the reason that it's like this as a concept has stayed a thing that we've been doing for this long um has been just it's really unique and it uses a lot of skills and a lot of parts of your brain that don't get associated with role playing a lot despite being very much parts of the brain that are connected with narrative and that are connected with emotion that are connected with all of these um other things that are very relevant to role playing and so we we liked that connection and we liked exercising that connection and seeing how we could tie all those things together. Right. Oh, that's that's very interesting. So basically trying trying to use completely different parts of your brain in order to play a role playing game that you don't typically use. Mm-hmm. OK, excellent. So when uh, when when we're talking about the, the game, uh, <laughs> that's called that word. Uh, <laughs> you, you, said, you were saying that you play both the, the characters and the soundtrack. So uh, how did you develop that kind of relationship where, where you are doing those two things? Let's see. We wanted it to be a traditional role-playing game in that you tell a story, and we figured that you couldn't tell a story entirely non-verbally, communicating verbally in some way to be on the same page as each other and to get, have everyone get a fulfilling experience out of that when not everyone's a musician. So we definitely had to have the traditional aspects of role-playing with your voice etc and um but we also wanted the music to not just take on a background role um we we wanted it to have some agency in the story and i forgot your original question (laughs) i just (laughs) went down that that. oh that's okay go down any roads that you would care to uh the, the one that i was asking was uh being both the character and the soundtrack how that development process went so um, one of the one of the things that we've spent the most time on over the course of developing this is talking about managing player attention um, and player focus and trying to make sure that everybody can um, focus on exactly the number of things that they're able to focus on. Because there was a, a, a big problem we had earlier on in development for a whole lot of the process was that when you're trying to have both music and player characters at the same time it's a lot to pay attention to at once and so we had to come up with systems where um you could kind of move your attention around flexibly in a way that worked for you at a given moment um a system where um there were a lot of material things that you could latch your attention on to we had to develop a system where there weren't so many things going on at once 
that you were overloaded and that you you couldn't pay attention to any of it because there was just so much happening. It was sensory overload. So we ended up with a system where at any given time, you are either your character or you're a musician because you cannot, for the most part, do both for an entire um, you know, three-hour RPG session. It would be too much for most people. So you go in and out of these roles um, over the course of the game and you can have your attention on different elements of play, um, sometimes on the music and sometimes on the, on the acting over the course of the scene, just kind of as the scene ebbs and flows. So having the game kind of organically create that rhythm of attention um, has been a really important part of the process. And part of the effect of that is that at any given time, you either are your character or you're the soundtrack. Okay, so now in each scene, do I, do I switch between doing the two things, or do I have to choose one per scene? You are one per scene, and um, it's not usually every player's choice. It's uh, cards are drawn to determine who is who, and some, some cards have player choice on them, so, but that's usually according to like the needs of the scene. Like If you just had a scene with two characters and you need one of them to continue on, it would just make sense narratively that way, then usually that person would choose to remain as their character for that next scene. That that kind of brings me to like how, how we actually play the game. Uh because I need to I, I need to paint a word picture for myself here. We we're, we used music and now I need I need paintings in my head here. So you mentioned cards. So uh the, the actual layout of the game, um how do you play Scherzando? Hey! You what? did it! Hey. Oh, I missed it. My so, audio cut out that, right that, at that moment. I'll, I'll do it again. Scorzando. Great. Hey, it only took Thanks. me like 20 minutes, but I got there. <laughs> it's all that matters. You know what? The important thing to me is that you tried your best. Yeah, and you know, uh, practice makes perfect. That's, <laughs> that's, that's also true in music. Uh, yeah, the, the, the structure of the game. How do you actually uh, play Skirtsando. When we say cards, we mean note cards. There are a lot of note cards involved in the game because we like note cards. There's no like formal printed cards for the game. So like we mentioned, it goes in a series of scenes and in a given scene, you're either a musician or a player character. Um, and at the top of the scene, each musician picks one of five different emotions. Um, and those five emotions are happiness, sadness, angerness, angerness. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Angriest. You know what? Keep that in. Just I want the world to know that that just happened. Um, Angriest. <laughs> anger, angerness will be all the rage. Happiness, sadness, angerness, tenderness, um, and of course, fearness. Um, <laughs> I approve. Each musician picks one of those five emotions. Usually the game gets explained over the course of play, so I'm trying to like condense it all into one description real quick here. You start the scene, um, the player characters play their characters, um, and the musicians play their music. Um, and if you, as the player, care, as the player, as an active player, detect that the musicians are trying to lean the scene towards a specific emotion because it's what they're holding on to, then maybe you want to kind of mimic that and pull in that direction as well. And once you reach what we call the apex of the scene, uh, which is where you know you have this moment where you would need a resolution mechanic, every player, every active player picks two of the five emotions that they think the musicians have, and then you uh, reveal all the emotions that everybody has picked, and you compare how many matches you have across the table, and then you look at the number of matches on a little chart, and the chart will tell you something like, uh, you achieve your goal, but at great cost, or you get what you want, but you go too far, or everything turns out worse than you imagined, much, much worse. Um, and then you decide how what that means for your scene, um, and then everybody takes the note card they have in front of them that says what role they are, and they give it to another player. And then you get ready to start another scene with that new group of characters. I don't want to explain every single mechanic in the game because it would take the full hour, but um, <laughs> you do that until you finish the narrative, until you reach a set of criteria that ends out the story. So basically, like, this has to be a cooperative experience. I have to actually like work with other people in order to do this. Oh, yes. Okay. No, it's very much a game that's about communication and is about collaboration. And those are very important uh, themes that we had going in that we've maintained the whole way through. 
So yeah, the, okay. So I get this. So the idea is that by trying to communicate this as best as you can, everybody understands that scene, and the better they understand that scene, the better it ends up for everybody. Yeah, that's about it. Perfect. It's a very Perfect. fluffy and interpretive system, especially if you're like coming in and you're new to games. It can be really easy to have like your first point of reference is like Dungeons and Dragons, which is this very crunchy system, which is all about. Um, kind of this individualist con like conquest where you um you get the biggest numbers um and you watch your numbers go up and you put your numbers against the other people's numbers and all of the information comes from this like hierarchical GM structure and and there's 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 all of these um kind of structures of gaming that that are very common for you know people who are getting in and only know the big consumerist games of the hobby like D and D. And I don't think D&D &D is an inherently bad game. I call myself a D&D &D apologist a lot. Um, <laughs> I think it has problems, but it, it, very, it very much is a different kind of game than what we're running here. We have a very story-based, very interpretive. It's really, it really is the kind of game that you would expect to come out of uh, two people who were majoring in humanities degrees at the time they made the game. That's fair. So, uh, so if I were to say, like, D&D &D is more on the mechanics heavy side this this would be more oh, on the like, are very yeah. yes uh this yeah. this this is much more on like the role-playing aspect side oh yeah that's good uh alex is is more the crunchy person and i'm more the fluffy person okay uh, sometimes i i do like some nice crunch but games like fate um for instance are a lot less crunchy and a lot more role-play oriented too so and you like those yes Yes, I do need them. <laughs> so so far, this is this is right up your alley. And I know music too. No music too. So that's that's good. So I would be the character and you would be my musician. No. So I'm wondering how you pick the scenes that you guys act out or that you uh role play out and you make the music to. Yeah. How is that decided upon in the game? We have a pretty extensive, like, setting up the game section where um, we use some of the mechanics that we mentioned in the scene to set up, like, the central conflicts that are going to be present in the story. We have the players talk about what kind, like, where they're going to set it, where they're going to set their story. So um, we have a table of like suggested items, but most of the time people just make up their own and it's great. What are some fun ones we've had? We've had like some kind of smuggling on a blueberry train in space. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a blueberry themed train. Um, we had a game set in the world's smallest target with the world's largest sandwich inside of it. So we also have people create features which are just things places peeps within the the world that they've set up so it could be like a rampaging of town or this one really really happy cashier who is happy to the point of being annoying we have those um recur throughout the game so at the start of each scene one or more of those features is introduced and has to um, appear also with note cards. We write the features down in note cards. When, you, um, when you're starting a scene, what you do is you look at whatever the last note card got made was and one other random note card from the past. And those are two features that like, are in this scene that you're about to play. You kind of have to um, integrate those somehow into your setup. So it just gives you like a, um, a structure and like a baseline and something to work off of when you're when you're coming up with what scene it is you you know what needs to be involved here from the features and you know which characters are in that and usually some kind of scene suggests itself from those two things um and then at the end of the scene you come up with a new feature that you put on a new note card um and then that becomes part of the next scene oh so okay. this kind of like propulsive related narrative right where every new thing that happens kind of leads into the next thing that happens that's fun so uh so a lot of it is done in setup but then there's there's some more that happens kind of uh, snowballing on itself as the game progresses forward. It very much is the game that snowballs, yes. I could have a game that's all about snowballs. Absolutely. And it, 
It would feel very meta if I did that, though. Oh, I want to play that game. Oh, that sounds so fun. Do you want to have a snowball? No, I can't do that. Anyway, <laughs> that, they've already done that, and it had music in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can't. Oh, well. Well, I, we, we know how that turned out, though. So, uh, and that, Amazingly good at the box office. And I think it had all five of those emotions. I think, they, <laughs> I think they succeeded in having all five of those emotions. Do you think well, it had fearness in it? I don't Yeah, well, you know, that giant ice monster. That's the true. Prince guy. I didn't like him. I didn't like him very much. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it had some fearness in it. Not a lot of fearness. Just a, a small tinge of fearness. A lot, a lot of sadness and, and angriness, but not a lot of fear. Nathan, do you need to let it go? <laughs> it's impossible for me to let it go, Alex. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um... <laughs> Look at the time. <laughs> so the scenario, the scene, the, uh, the uh, kind of the propulsion forward, that, that's all done by the players themselves. Yeah. Scared Sando. See, I'm going to spam that as much as I possibly can. Uh, a very big thank you to Amber Gilchrist and Elizabeth Belisario for being on the show to explain how to properly pronounce that word. Um, and uh, we will have more with them on the next show where we talk a little bit more about the Kickstarter, which is uh, coming out in October. Some of the things that we were talking about in this episode were a little bit far removed. We had recorded this uh, a while ago, so it, it might seem like some of the things are up in the air, but that's just because of timing. Uh, I also want to apologize if it seemed like some of the audio might be cutting out a little bit. Um, we did have the call drop in certain places, and I tried to fix what I could, but it might still be noticeable in some places. Anyway, uh, if you want to find out more about Scherzando, which I am going to continually spam, as I just said, you can actually go to www.scherzandogame.com, uh, and if you uh, put a uh, slash beta on the end, uh, you can check out the beta for the game and uh, look at it yourself. Uh, and you can also find them on Twitter, at ScherzandoRPG. Also, it's probably worth noting how to actually spell Scherzando is S-C-H-E-R-Z-A-N-D-O. That's worth, like, a lot of points in Scrabble. I, I don't know how you're gonna do it. But uh, it's a worth a lot of points. Make sure that the Z is on like a triple letter score and you are in great shape right there. If you want to find out more information about Delve, go over to DelveCast.com. Uh, you can find all of our stuff there. You can also click on the Patreon banner and check that out because we have some exclusive extended episodes and such over there. If you become a patron, even at the $1 level, and if you are at our $5 shiny level, you can be... Uh, you can be mentioned on this show. And so our shiny level patrons are Dom Perry and Bonnie Ainsworth. And thank you both for being so supportive of this show in past, present, and hopefully in the future. Uh, you can also find us on all sorts of podcast apps, including iTunes and Google Play and, and pretty much everywhere else. Uh, we're, we're everywhere. You know, just go there and whatever you're using, you know, like or subscribe or do any of those things that you would prefer. Uh, if there's a way to give me stars, I like those. If you could give me those, that would be terrific. I'll appreciate it, even if I'm not aware of it. it I, I hear a bell every time somebody gives me a star. And so, uh, or maybe that's just a ringing in my ears. Anyway, the point is it's uh, well appreciated. And uh, we are also on Twitter. I am at Citanium. Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. Uh, so we are going to return on next week's episode to discuss a little bit more about Scherzando. It actually flows so much better than I originally thought. Uh, and uh, until then, uh, please remember to improvise your life. That's terrible advice. Don't it? No, have a plan. Do a combination of the two. Have, have a little improvisational time, but also try to keep a structure involved. 
you know what? When we actually come back and explain more about Scarteno, maybe you'll get a, a better a better idea of the give and take for this. I don't I don't really know how to explain it otherwise. Anyway, thank you for listening, and we'll uh, we'll talk to you on the next one. Goodbye. It'll catch all the things. We will catch all the things, like Pokemon. I It'll need catch. to tell people what my friend code is online. That's the other thing I gotta remember to do. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> They're making me do it as part of a quest now, Alex. Right. I'm Anyways, sorry. Anyways, Nathan. Anyway, yes, we're not here to talk about that.